Hello everyone, um, thanks for joining um, our webinar session um, on how to tackle hypo and hypoglycemia. Um, so this is an FY1 series for incoming FY1s um, hosted by Mind the Bleep. My name is Shruti, I am a um, currently in my FY3 year um, and one of the co-leads um, of the FY1 division of Mind the Bleep. Today, we're very lucky to have Glenn with us, who's an FY3, um, who will be starting as FY3, actually, as a junior clinical fellow in, as a junior clinical fellow in endocrinology. Sorry, that's a bit of a mouthful for me. Um, and we're really pleased to have him to talk about this topic. Um, and the reason why I really wanted to have this topic um, as part of your FY1 webinar series is because you will be dealing with this day in, day out, during award duties, as well as during on calls and it's during when you when you're on, on, on your on call where all these difficult sort of case scenarios comes up and you're like scratching your head but of course they're seeing your help but it's always nice to know exactly what you should think about so you at least you know assess the patient and think about the things that's needed to be done and when you do present it to your registrar so seek help from an SHO you're at a better better um level compared to to someone who doesn't have a clue on what to do. So to help you improve your knowledge on uh, hypoglycemia and hypoglycemia, let me introduce Glenn um, and he'll take over from here. Thank you so much, Trudy. Right, first of all, let's just make sure that um, you can all hear me. Can people um, type in the chat? Just let, let me know uh, that you can all hear me right. If the chat is working, people can use the chat. Ah, fantastic, thank you, Hannah. Grand stuff. So uh, I shall make a start and just, Shruti, you can still see my slides moving, yeah? Yeah, I can see it. It's on learning outcomes now. Grand stuff. So we'll spend the next, I'd say, 35 to 40 minutes or so. Um, thank you for all the people coming through on the chat saying you can hear me. Marvellous. If at any point I'm going too fast, just uh, type in the chat, tell me to slow down. Um, the function of today is, as I said, to spend the next maybe... 35 to 40 minutes to run through um, sugar management, blood sugar management in, in patients in hospital. Um, I'm fortunate, fortunate enough that um, I had a placement in diabetes and endocrinology during my foundation years, and I had a specialist interest in the subject anyway. But you will come across diabetic patients on all the wards, on surgical wards, um, on a lot of respiratory wards, a lot of patients um, will come with will come in for treatment that will affect their blood sugar, um, especially steroids with a lot of COPD patients and a lot of rheumatology patients as well. Um, and outside of diabetic departments, I think that it is something that is thoughtlessly managed um, and something that if even as an F1, you can wrap your head around and, and treat proactively, you will be an absolute boon to your department. So we will cover low blood sugar, and we will cover three different types of high blood sugar, diabetic ketoacidosis, HHS, and finally, something that is often overlooked, what happens when you're called at four o'clock in the morning and your patient's got high blood sugar, but they don't have either of those other two conditions. So what do we do then? And the point of today is to make sure that we can recognize the con these conditions and initiate the management of. As a foundation doctor, you just need to get the ball rolling. And there are very few diseases that I don't think you should be escalating up to your uh, SHO or even the registrar. So let's talk about a case. There you have got a 60 year old male with a background of only hypertension. He's actually really, really fit and well, but he has been brought in by ambulance after being found unconscious at home. He is not responding to voice and he is only mildly rousable to pain. Throw out some options in the chat. You, we've all done our, uh, our recognizing and responding to acute patient deterioration. What are you folks going to do? I can see A to E assessment. Anything else, folks? Another vote for A to E assessment. Marvellous. I'll give you a few more seconds, see if anybody else wants to throw their hat in the ring. Grand collateral history as well. Yes, I completely agree with any patients, even if they're not acutely unwell. I don't think you can go far wrong with doing a quick A to E to make sure there's nothing obvious. And yes, fantastic. So 
as part of your A to E assessments, remember, don't ever forget glucose. Um, they're maintaining their own airway. They're just not responsive. They're hemodynamically stable and um, and perfusing their peripheries well. But that blood sugar comes back at 2.8. And this is a patient that I saw. And uh, they had come in with hypoglycemia three times in the absence of any obvious blood sugar disorders. The only thing of note was that this gentleman's wife had type 2 diabetes and had uh, did take a sulfonylurea um, and she had access to the medicine cabinet. Despite multiple uh, attempts to safeguard this gentleman, he had capacity, he refused to accept the possibility that his wife might be slipping him some uh, tablets to uh, send him hypoglycemic. Unfortunately, I haven't seen him for a few months, but the story was the same every single time. He could not account for how sulfonylurea has got into his system. So just a bit of flavour for this case. The crux of the issue is that it is hypoglycemia. And we'll focus slightly differently to the case here on hypoglycemia in diabetics. The reason for that is that the cutoffs are slightly different. In people with normal glucose metabolism uh, processes, uh, hypoglycemia is, is three and under, but we try to keep it above four in people with diabetes. Now, I, it was never properly explained to me in med school why the symptoms that you get are the symptoms that you get and the re the reason that you get sweaty anxiety tingling shaking tachycardia when you start to become hypoglycemic certainly in the three to four range in diabetics is because it releases adrenaline low blood sugar causes you to release adrenaline so your Mild hypoglycemia is consistent with symptoms of sympathetic activation. Now, lower than that, it starts to affect your brain's ability to, uh, to function. So that's when you start to get the neuroglycopenic effects, behavior changes, confusion, speech disturbance. And if you drop lower, you will eventually become stuporous, enter a coma, convulse, and it can even kill you. Now, in people with chronic diabetes who may well have multiple hypoglycemic events, that catecholamine, that, that sympathetic activation may become blunted. And so they may not get that sympathetic fight or flight style response every, every single time they drop below four. And that is called hypo unawareness. That means that people might not just might not notice their uh, hypoglycemic until they start hitting the two or less mark. That's how that occurs. So how do we treat it? Now, you'll see lots of different uh, guidelines, lots of different protocols saying, oh, if the patient's awake, give them this. If the patient's asleep, give them this. If they can swallow, if they can't swallow. The, the basic rule is that you need to get 20 grams of rapid acting glucose into their bloodstream somehow. So it doesn't really matter how you do it. You just got to get it in them. So you can give that 20 grams of glucose through glucose juice or glucose tabs or an energy drink. If they're struggling to swallow, then just give that 20, glucose, 20 grams of glucose in the form of glucogel and rub it into their gums and inside their mouth or on their buccal mucosa. If they can't swallow anything and you can't get access to their mouth, then you'll have to give it through their bloodstream. And so 200 mils of 10% of dextrose or 100 mils of 20% dextrose, they are both the same thing. They are both 20 grams of glucose. I would always advise, if you can, giving the lower percentage, 10%, because the higher percentage glucose, certainly up to 50%, are really viscous, really irritants, can extravasate and cause serious issues. Now, if you can't even get venous access, then you might need to give them some glucagon. Now, this substance will cause the liver to release from their glycogen stores 
uh, the blood sugar into the bloodstream. But remember, because of this, glucagon will only work if there is sugar stored in the liver to release. If you have a person with chronic starvation such that their liver has already used up that back supply of glucose or if somebody is recurrently hypoglycemic and they've already had glucagon such that their liver has already released released that supply then the glucagon is not going to work so step one get 20 grams of glucose in them doesn't matter how we've listed a fair few different ways there takes about 15 minutes to work so check them again and you can repeat these measures a few times. If a person is requiring three boluses, so 45 minutes total, you really should be getting a grown up involved, even possibly an ICU review. Once that person has got their blood sugar back over four in a diabetic, then the job there is to make sure they maintain their blood sugar. And so instead of a rapid acting, easily accessible glucose supply, give them something longer acting. Give them those glucose molecules in a chain of carbohydrate that they have to break down over a longer, longer uh, period of time. But that will be about 20 grams as well. And if you have caused them to deplete their glucose supply from their liver, replenish it. Give them the same again. Does that make sense to everybody? Does anybody have any questions about treating hypoglycemia before we move on? At this point, whilst you're typing uh, any questions over the next 30 seconds, I will say a, a it really is step two is something that can catch foundation doctors out. It certainly caught me out. If a person is starved, for example, somebody who's been nil by mouth, chronically demented, for example, um, if they are hypoglycemic because of starvation, and you've given them a rapid acting bit of glucose and I've gone brilliant jobs are good and, and I've gone back to the mess to try and get some sleep in a, a few hours they will be hypoglycemic again because they've used it up if this is the case consider giving them a longer term glucose infusion or um, uh, parenteral nutrition to try and maintain that because you're just putting a, a sticking plaster over a more chronic problem. See a question here. Do diabetics have higher glucose reference ranges because of risk of hypos? Uh, yes. Yes, that is why hypoglycemia is a very common issue for diabetics in hospital. So we tolerate a higher reference range. Also, when people come into hospital, um, various medications and illnesses can send their blood sugars haywire. So we tolerate a slightly broader range there as well, because it's just unfair to expect such tight control when half of the things we're doing to the patients is probably going to cause them problems in that respect. Iatrogenic uh, sugar disorder, sugar problems is very common in hospital. Thank you, Usman. Right, we shall move on to our next case. No, we won't. Bit of bonus points for any of you. Um, I like to use the acronym um, Explain Posh to help memorize some of the more common, there are certainly others more common causes of hypoglycemia. Exogenous drugs, alcohol, insulin, sulfonylurea, as was the case with our poor gentleman, pituitary disease, liver disease, adrenal insufficiency, Addison's disease, infections, including sepsis and neoplasm. That's not just in including insulin, secreting tumours, but any tumour that's really, really hungry and metabolically active will be churning through a lot of your blood sugar. Pregnancy, some types of renal of uh, uh, organ failure, starvation and hypothyroidism. Explain posh. Always comes in really, really handy uh, if you can quickly list off some of those potential causes. So next case, 68 year old man with chronic kidney disease and active lung cancer under treatments presented to the emergency department with vomiting, shortness of breath and severe dehydration. Now, I saw this gentleman about six hours after he was admitted. He'd been seen by the renal consultant, um, thought to be in AKI secondary to uh, vomiting caused by nausea related to his chemotherapy, was put on a bicarbonate infusion, given some fluids. I was called to him in the middle of the night um, because he was getting worse and worse. Um, type in the box there, what, type, type in the chat, what are you going to do? Uh, how are you going to approach this case while I look at Martin's question? 
Ah, so a long, so if a patient is starved, what's an example of a longer term? Oh, so do you mean, Martin, that if they have depleted their glycogen stores? Um, yeah, longer acting carbohydrates, so biscuits, bread, yeah, anything that's not pure sugar through your glucogel, your energy drinks, your glucotabs, things like that, that should work very well. What a longer term glucose regime can be part of your, your salty and sweet. Um, if a person is starved or nil by mouth, then you can start working out their, their daily requirements, typically 50 to 100 grams of glucose uh, for any person per day. So what are you folks going to be doing with this uh, with this gentleman? You've been asked to go and see him. Uh, I'll give you a clue. It's going to be very similar to what you were going to be doing with the previous gentleman. Oh, ABG, yes. Um, certainly a blood gas, yes. Um, Thank you, Pietro. Yes, um, potentially a venous gas, um, A to E, fantastic, James. Yes, um, I would probably have done a venous gas. Indeed, I did do a venous gas on this gentleman um, purely because I, he was oxygenating fine. Although certainly if you did have any concerns about their uh, their ability to ventilate and, and respirate, then uh, an arterial sample would have been very reasonable. So this is what you get. Uh, a pH exceedingly low, a blood glucose. I remember the nurse came to me and said, the blood glucose meter just says high. And I said, okay, how high? And they said, I don't know. The machine just says high. And that's the point at which I started feeling quite scared. Um, and I quickly checked their blood for ketones and it came back raised at 5.8. Now, this gentleman does not have diabetes. He has no history of diabetes. What's the diagnosis here, folks? Usman says, was going to say DKA, but never mind. Why never mind? OK, then I he meets the criteria, but I said he's not diabetic. So no medical history of diabetes. Um, Unless he's undiagnosed. Now, that is a very interesting question. Starvation can certainly cause ketonemia. Yes, exactly. Very true. But the blood sugar that high with um, a pH of 7.23, something's going on here. Um, actually, Usman, I'm going to tell you to back yourself. Um, he meets the criteria for DKA. Um, the guidelines and most hospital guidelines don't state that you necessarily need a diagnosis of diabetes. Otherwise, all those first presentations of diabetes uh, in teenagers would never be treated as DKA, would they? Often DKA is the first time that people, DKA can indeed be the first presentation. And this is some. This is a gentleman that I saw in my F1 year on nights. Can anybody guess, and this is a very, very tricky question. It took me ages to figure it out. How has this 68 year old man ended up with diabetes? Rapid onset diabetes within the last few weeks. TLS, Pietro, is that tumor lysis syndrome? Um, I wouldn't say it's necessarily tumor lysis syndrome. I would say it's definitely something to do with his cancer or perhaps the treatment of his cancer. Liver Mets. Oh, interesting thought. Yes. What if uh, what if those there's Mets to the pancreas and causing diabetes, uh, diabetes that way? This gentleman was on immunotherapy. Tumor secreting glucagon. Oh, these are paraneoplastic syndromes. I'm loving all this stuff. Hepatotoxic medication. Fantastic. The answer, far simpler than some of the fantastic and wonderful stuff that you folks are coming up with, is he was on immunotherapy. It is becoming increasingly common that people will be on a chemotherapy called immune checkpoint inhibitors that will help, um, I, I suppose, invigorate the, the body's immune response against a tumour. Unfortunately, that can sometimes result in side effects, including autoimmune disease. This gentleman had developed autoimmune diabetes as a result of his immunotherapy for his cancer. Chemo induced hyperglycemia. It was chemo induced diabetes causing hyperglycemia and DKA. 
And that's what's going on here. So if you look at DKA criteria, blood glucose greater than 11, which is actually surprisingly low, but you can get normal glycemic DKA. That's something to go away and read up on. Ketones and some form of acidosis. This gentleman qualifies. If you um, alpestilib, certainly yes, and ibidamine, yes, some form of immunotherapy, yes. Um, if you satisfy those three criteria, you are well within your rights to start a patient on diabetic ketoacidosis protocol. They will, there will be protocols in your trust. Get access to your um, to your trust document management system. Print off that protocol and treat them. And what's actually going on in DKA? Well, in diabetes, what you've got to understand, and something that I don't think is taught particularly well, is diabetics are in starvation mode. They've got high blood sugar, but without that insulin, without the recognition of that insulin, they cannot access it. The body is blind to the glucose. And therefore, any slight insults, infection, stress, cessation of insulin therapy could cause a, a cortisol mediated stress response that will tip the body into full catabolic processes, gluconeogenesis and ketogenesis. And this will spiral and spiral and spiral until you end up acidemic, severely dehydrated as a result of osmotic diuresis and with ketones through the roof. That's how DKA works. So how do we treat it? Well, the thing that's going to kill you is dehydration. Fluid is the first step. Give them loads of fluid. About one-tenth of their body weight, okay, per hour. Uh, sorry, uh, that's in insulin. Sorry, fluid resuscitate through boluses and res uh, resuscitate uh, with bolus resuscitation, replacement, and eventually maintenance. But for insulin, you give them a fixed rate because there's no point in doing a sliding scale because you're just going to keep on going up and up and up and up and up and up because you're not going to bring that blood sugar down. Fixed rate insulin at about one tenth of their body weight per hour, 70 kilogram or 80, so uh, 80 kilogram male, about eight units an hour. Monitor their user needs. So they may well be hypokalemic. They may well be hyperkalemic. So don't automatically give them potassium. Check their VBG and make sure that they're not going hypokalemic as you give them their insulin. Now, interestingly, and a top tip for your F1, F2, is if they become hypoglycemic, that is, you're giving them the insulin and their blood sugar drops below five, below four, but they remain ketotic and they remain acidemic then you have not successfully treated their DKA. So continue to give them the insulin. Just give them glucose as well to help maintain their blood sugar. The insulin is fixing the acidemia. The insulin is fixing the DKA. It doesn't matter whether or not you're necessarily treating the, the um hyperglycemia as well so the point is you don't need you don't need to worry about giving somebody blood uh, sugar if they're still in dka does that make sense folks if a patient during treatment for dka becomes hypoglycemic but they still need treatment just give them sugar don't stop the treatment okay folks I'll read out this case while I'm doing so. You're more than welcome to chime in with any questions. We'll, we'll certainly have a quarter of an hour to 20 minutes um, Q&A at the end if you have any standing questions. But let's move on to the next case. And I'm more than happy to stop for any questions you have about DKA before we move on. So an 80 year old male with a background of dementia, heart failure and very poorly controlled diabetes type 2. He's found on the floor. They thought he's been on there for a couple of days, grossly etheromatous, red legs, and he's very, very dehydrated. So, folks, not to have her at home too much, but how are we going to approach this patient? He's wheeled into recess, looking like a prune, dehydrated and crispy, with big, swollen red legs that are hot to the touch. How are we going to approach the management of this gentleman? Thank you, Hannah Brown. You are noticing a pattern here, phase as well. Yes, A to E. Brilliant. 
HVC assessment, focused assessment. Yeah, let's have a look at those legs. Um, yep, let's do some blood tests as well. So, of course, he's diabetic, so let's get some ketones. They're mildly raised, which would be consistent with starvation, as some of you astutely pointed out earlier on. He does have a very, very high blood glucose at 36, paradoxically, given he doesn't seem to have been eating over the last couple of days. He is profoundly dehydrated. And because you're smart, you do a quick uh, serum osmolality. Um, and it comes back at 342. Eric G, yes. HHS. Sepsis screen, yes. He's found to have cellulitis of the legs. And so let's start him on IV antibiotics. Um, he's not septic. So let's just hope that these IV antibiotics will treat his uh, infection. But the thing that is going to kill him, Eric, yes, you're right, is HHS. He has HHS in this situation, something uh, that used to be called honk, uh, now known as HHS. He is hyperglycemic. He is hyperosmolar. I can tell you that 320 to 330 tends to be the the, the, the nationally regarded cutoff point for serum osmolality. Um, so he is, if you work through HHS, well, he's in a state and he's hyperglycemic and he is hyperosmolar. So he pretty much satisfies the criteria for HHS there. So yes, on top of treating the infection, let's treat the HHS because that's what's going to kill him. Just to reiterate those um, those diagnostic criteria, there there is not there is no definitive diagnostic criteria set out uh, like there is for DKA really, but the the majority of resources will will suggest that there has to be significant hyperglycemia. There needs to be significant dehydration resulting in a raised serum osmolality, a cutoff of about 320 and above, and there needs to be absence of significant ketoacidosis. Yes, you can have ketones, but that might well be the result of dehydration or starvation. If you've got a type two diabetic who is hyperglycemic with a raised serum osmolality, but they are also acidotic and ketotic, that's an automatic DKA until proven otherwise. People with type two diabetes can get DKA. People with type two diabetes can be given treatments that cause DKA. So it's certain, and people with supposed type two diabetes may well, in fact, have missed maturity onset type one diabetes or latent autoimmune diabetes. So never let a diagnosis of type two diabetes trick you into assuming that this could never be a DKA. But this is a HHS barn door, plain and simple. So how do we treat it? Just like DKA fluid resuscitation. And a little tip um, that could trip you up in F1 and F2 is you always give a hell of a lot more fluid than you think. Yes, it's always tricky if a patient has heart failure or kidney failure, but those scenarios notwithstanding, you want to be giving those patients three to six litres of fluid positive. So that's on top of whatever they're, they're, they're weighing out as well within the first 12 hours you do not treat necessarily with insulin. You treat the dehydration and eventually the blood sugar should sort itself out. Okay. Eric says, some sources suggest raised ketones in HHS. You give some insulin instead of one, as in DKA. Good question. Um, and I certainly don't think that that's unsafe or necessarily wrong. If a patient in HHS has, say, insulin treated or insulin managed type 2 diabetes, as is becoming increasingly common, as you may well be aware from your finals, some patients when they've not been satisfactorily controlled on oral antihyperglycemics, um, may well be escalated onto insulin. And so if a patient is in HHS, um, you may well be giving them insulin anyway as part of their usual regime. Or if they're nil by mouth, you may well be putting them on a sliding scale, a variable rate insulin regime or a GKI uh, to manage that. I, I would suggest that certainly most hospital trusts and I would say a lot of a lot of 
professional body guidance doesn't necessarily say that you have to give insulin. And indeed, I would say that if you adequately rehydrate them, then the blood sugar should drop with it. Certainly if it's not and you're worried that they might well go back into HHS or uh, they're continuing to diarrhese themselves excessively, insulin may well be the next course of option. But I would say as an F1 or an F2, you uh, starting insulin in a non-insulin dependent type 2 diabetic who is not nil by mouth um, is certainly a, a, an escalatable decision. Does that make sense, Eric? I hope that answers your question. Yes, giving them a half rate is, is perfectly reasonable, but I would say fluid is the is the way to go. And if you are thinking about insulin, ask grown up, get a diabetologist. They'll love something like this. They'll go, oh, good question. You've clearly done your research and they'll be your friend for the rest of your placement. Things to consider are that just as with DKA, this has been triggered by a stress response. So what is causing the stress? You've got to treat that as well. Is it infection? Is it an Addisonian crisis? God forbid. Treat the underlying cause, otherwise they'll just go back into it. Consider VTE prophylaxis. When you are dehydrated, your blood becomes coagulopathic. You become clotty. So if you are treating somebody for HHS, you need to be treating them for a potential clot as well. Get those stockings on, give them a decent dose of, of Fragmin, low molecular weight heparin, whatever your local trust advises. Now, HHS is often dismissed by a lot of people. I don't know whether it's because type 2 diabetes tends to be considered rather de rigueur these days. I would caution you, and I hope that, that, uh, that you do take it seriously already. I would say that HHS needs to be monitored very, very closely. These patients can become very, very sick. If there is a suggestion of severe AKI secondary to the dehydration, if they are so dehydrated that um, they are dropping their GCS or they're becoming hypothermic, or if they are so dehydrated that their sodium is by, by dilution, by concentration, uh, rocketing up to 150, 160, consider ICU discussion. If there are any risk factors in a patient with HHS, yes, treat them, but certainly make sure that somebody, uh, either a medical registrar or maybe your, your ICU colleagues have come over to review them. Because if there's any of these signs, these patients could severely deteriorate. OK, right. We've got about 10 minutes to a quarter of an hour of, of the of, of what uh, I suppose of me of me jabbering away at you and we'll move on to what I think is probably the most valuable thing that we need to be covering today um, and let's present it let's frame it with a case it's uh, eight o'clock in the evening you're on call um, and you're called to see a patient who's been admitted with covid um, because their blood sugar is 27 they're 50 years old type 2 on a basal bolus regime by which I mean they have long acting in the mornings 10 units and then four units of rapid acting with their meal times and before they came into hospital they were really really well controlled you go and assess them and they feel really really well they've just not been eating much because they're feeling unwell and they've got the oxygen mask on so they're just not really feeling much to eating and they they feel breathless without it so they can't really eat other than that, they're pretty fine and dandy. Their pH is pretty much slap bang, nice in the middle. You, Because you're an excellent F1 and you remembered my lecture, you've checked their serum osmolality and it's 290, way below the 320 threshold. They are negative for ketones. And their BN, their blood sugar, is only 27. I mean, yes, you should always make absolutely sure that they're not in DKA or HHS, but it's not, you know, 36, 37. It's not terrifying. I'm going to ask you two questions. First of all, use a bit of problem solving, a bit of lateral thinking. This patient had perfectly well controlled blood sugars before they came into hospital. Question one for you folks. Why is their blood sugar now out of control? I say out of control. Why is it now higher than it should be? Why is it now out of range? Let's give you 20 or 30 seconds to, uh, to answer that. Oh, Hannah, great.
great. So we've got a few different options there. Diabetes sick day, yeah, when you're sick, all of those um, cortisol uh, responses will affect your blood sugar metabolism, certainly. Miss could well have missed a dose, fantastic. Yeah, we, know, we always think about the physiological processes and we never really think about, uh, have we actually been giving them their medication? Was there a nursing handover and it was mixed, missed? Sympathetic response to infection could well be could well be iatrogenic cause very reasonable yes so we have some have we given them their wrong blood sugar um infection yes will affect your blood sugar stress response sick day it will go and i'm gonna i'm going to tie together tia hannah and um phases answers uh there COVID-19 induced diabetes, but uh, potentially very, very rare. Certain viral infections have been implicated in the development of autoimmune disease, but that is, uh, that's certainly a PhD project waiting to happen far beyond my expertise there, Tanisha. Um, in this gentleman who I saw, um, he's on oxygen with his COVID and so therefore automatically qualified for dexamethasone. And exactly right, iatrogenically, um, we have put him on steroids. Uh, which have sent his blood sugar spiraling out. So what I'm going to ask you now, before we move on to the next slide, I'm going to ask you folks, how will you manage this? The nurse has called you because the protocol, the blood sugar chart says escalate when their BM goes over 14, goes over 19, whatever it is in your local trust. The nurse has called you because this person qualifies for review. How are you going to manage this, this gentleman, if at all? Bear in mind, doing nothing is perfectly reasonable. Watch and wait, continue to monitor. I just want to ask what you folks uh, uh, would, would probably do, because in a few weeks, this may well be your, your first on-call patient. Ask for help. Very reasonable, yes. Monitor closely. Interesting. I like that watch and wait. Certainly something that I, I find myself doing more often as, I, as I'm becoming more and more confident as a, as a junior doctor. Any other things? Would anybody go for insulin? Would anybody give them anything? Stop the decks. Ah, interesting. Interesting. Um, may they may well qualify if their if their uh, state is improving you know could we stop the dex um i probably wouldn't they're still requiring oxygen so maybe keep them on dex for now but certainly if they qualified you'd want to stop that dex as soon as possible ng to help with nutrition yeah let's ask for help maybe a dose of this yeah so very i'm seeing a lot of asks for help um shri ng to help with nutrition well, this gentleman's BMs are too high as opposed to too low, but certainly they might well want to be, want to be closer, closely monitoring their nutritional intake. Monitor and considering discussing with seniors to increase basal insulin, um, increase morning dose. Yeah, I'm liking all of these answers. If only issue is hypoglycemia, otherwise fine, then gently increasing insulin would be reasonable. Yeah. Um, what I'm going to say here is that there are there's no perfect answer and there are certainly a lot of answers that aren't wrong. And I'd say the vast majority of what I've seen in the chat, there are all very reasonable things that you could do here. Let's talk through some basic principles and I'd probably tell you what I'd do um, with this gentleman. Um, if it is a non-urgent hyperglycemia, which is the phrase that I would use to characterize this in instances where there's no DKA, no HHS, you've got time to figure out the pattern. And that is what will tell you how you're going to manage this. Is this a new or old? Look back through their charts. Have they been hyperglycemic throughout their admission or is this a sudden one off spike? Check the HbA1c if they're a new inpatient. If it's really, really high, then maybe hyperglycemia is something that's been going on for a fair while. I'd also consider, is there anything that we've done to cause this? For example, if we're putting them on a short course of steroids and then we whack up their long-term insulin and discharge them on that, then they're going to go hypoglycemic the moment they finish their steroid course. So you just it's just an accident waiting to happen. On the right is a is a is, a, is an example chart of what I like to draw. I like to draw through the days. Yes, the, 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 the blood sugar charts do do something like this, but I, I just prefer being able to graph it out in my own head. I like to graph their blood sugar measurements and co correlate that with when were their meal times, when were their rapid acting doses, when were their long acting doses. Because if you're seeing any particular spikes, that's when you can start to think about 
that are maybe helping with a rapid acting. If they've got a sudden spike and it's not coming down after a meal time, then you might need to increase that rapid acting dose. But if they are chronically high and they spike and then come back to normal or come back to their, their baseline after a meal, then actually that mealtime rapid acting insulin is perfectly combating the amount of sugar they're taking in with their meal. So maybe giving a more longer acting, reducing their entire baseline is the way to go, if that makes sense. It becomes so much clearer when you draw it. The principles of management are if they are chronically hyperglycemic, their HbA1c is raised, then just follow the nice guidelines. Up their metformin, up their glycoside, work through that ladder of treatment. If a patient needs insulin, then you can usually give them a the, or starting on a new basal bolus regime, then typically just over half their body weight um, converted into units should be around their total daily requirements of insulin. If you want to split that into a basal bolus regime, then give about half as a basal and then split that other half into three so that's sixths, I suppose, to give their mealtime dose. So, for example, or can I do this in a simple way? Uh, say I'm 60 kilograms and you want to start me on a basal bolus regime, uh, uh, assuming that there's no other antihyperglycemics on board. I'm 60 kilograms. Then that would equate to probably a 30 units per day of long acting and then 10, 10 and 10 of rapid acting with meals. Does that make sense, folks? Does that maths make sense? Moving, over, moving through the rest um, of the principles of management, what I would say is that even rapid acting insulin can take two to four hours to peak. Uh, if anything I could impart to you that will make your lives easier on your night shifts when you start work is if a patient is non-urgently hyperglycemic and you are giving them a stat dose of insulin to bring their insulin down, tell the nursing team, do not take their BM for another three hours, three or four hours, because you won't see the effects of what you've given until then. If they call you in one hour and they're still hyperglycemic, you, you may be tempted to give them another stat of insulin. But in three to four hours, suddenly double dose will take effect and you may well make them uh, hypoglycemic. That also gives you some breathing space. OK, the nurses will love not having to take their blood sugar for another three hours. All I'm saying is you can get a couple of hours nap. And then after once you've woken up, then you'll see the effect of the management changes that you've made. And then you can act on it. Martin, could I repeat that? Yes. So as I said, as a general rule, and I, I certainly would say that as a foundation doctor, you should never be starting somebody um, apropos of nothing on, on a, a, a basal bolus new insulin regime if they've not been on it before. But for future reference, a, six, a person will need. Uh, sorry, no, I did that calculation wrong. A person will need about just over half their body weight in units per day in insulin. And then you can split that into half again will be long acting and then split that remaining half into three for their rapid acting. I did the maths wrong. I forgot to have it. If you are 60 kilograms, for example, then your total requirement of insulin will be 30 or 0. Well, 0. 0.6. So let's say that's about 36. Split that in half. So what's half of 36? 18. That will be 18 units of long acting in a day and then six, six and six of rapid acting with meals. Does that make sense, Martin? I apologize that I got that maths wrong the first time. It's harder than it looks. Does that make sense that time? 60, if you're 60 kilograms, then that will be, what did I say? about 18 and six, six and six. I picked 60 because it's easily divisible by six and a half because I can't do mental maths that fast in my head. Um, what I would have done with this gentleman in question in this case was I would have given him some fluid. He's not been eating, he's not been drinking, he's probably a bit dehydrated. That can cause an apparently high blood sugar. And just as with HHS, although slightly on a, a, a more microscopic scale, I suppose, giving them a bit of IV fluid may well help dilute that blood sugar and bring it down without having to tinker with their insulin. The point is, 
be safe. And what I would say as a final point is that you should never aim for perfect control. You're never going to get that person in the four to eight range. Tolerate 12 and below, because if you go too hard and are too strident with it, then you may well accidentally make them hypoglycemic. With that in mind, good control is indeed better than excellent control, certainly in hospital. So to summarize, hypoglycemia, remember the rule is 20 grams of sugar. Is that 200 mils or 10%? Is that a bit of uh, glucagon? Is it, you know, 20 grams of rapid uh, of rapid acting sugar like a glucogel or a glucotab? Get that sugar in them and let the state of the patient decide how you administer it. In urgent hyperglycemia, that is DKA or HHS, the treatment is fluid. The dehydration will kill them and then treating them with the fluid will help with the astemia and a fixed rate insulin will also help in instances of ketoacidosis. Finally, if it's non-urgent hyperglycemia, you have the time. And if you're feeling particularly studious, draw out a graph, take 20 minutes, work it out and propose a really strong plan. Are you just going to give them fluid management? Are you going to watch and wait? Are you going to change their bolus? Are you going to trial increasing their rapid acting regime? Or are you just going to tell them to eat less because they just had a massive meal? Okay. That's everything I want to say. Hopefully we've just run to time, three quarters of an hour, grand slightly longer. Um, I am more than happy to take the next 10 minutes, quarter of an hour or so until eight o'clock to answer any final questions um, about mon uh, man managing blood sugar issues in, in hospital patients or indeed about any questions that you might have about uh, starting, uh, starting F1 because I know I was bloody terrified at this point a few years ago. Thank you so much, Glenn. That was an amazing presentation. You were so clear. And thank you for going through the questions as well as you were um, discussing the cases. Really good scenarios, um, making everyone think. And also I'd like to say a thank you to the audience as well for um, really um, engaging with the presentation and, um, you know, uh, asking, asking away, because that's what I like to see. So I think Tia... Um, Cassell has a question. So how to differentiate urgent versus non-urgent hyperglycemia? Is it only if it is classed as HHS slash DKA, DKA or significantly raised greater than 30? Mm, that's a great question, Tia. What, what I would say um, is there are plenty of patients who will be hyperglycemic and also unwell because of something else. Uh, think of, for example, um, that HHS patient. Imagine if they weren't in HHS, uh, but they had a significantly raised blood sugar because of their, their infection. So they still had the cellulitis. So they, they are still urgently unwell, but I would say that you don't necessarily need to be treating the hyperglycemia. What I would say is that how what's the best way to phrase this okay i would say that the only re, the really the only instances in which hyperglycemia can cause somebody to be urgently unwell is if it is causing dka or hhs i can't think of any condition that is characterized by hyperglycemia in which the hyperglycemia is causing the problem if your blood sugar rises and rises and rises the thing that's that's that the problem that that's going to cause is um, osmotic diuresis. It's going to cause osmotic issues. Your glucose is is osmotically active, and so if you are if you're hyperglycemic to the extent that that starts to cause problems, it's going to be because it's causing you to urinate out more fluid than you should, and that's going to cause dehydration. But Think about it. That is, by definition, HHS or DKA. So I would say that by definition, urgent hyperglycemia has to be either HHS or DKA, if that makes sense. If somebody has significantly raised blood sugar greater than 30, I would urgently want to get that back under control to prevent them from going into HHS or DKA. I hope that makes sense. I would say that if they're not in HHS and they're not in DKA, you have more time to manage it.
OK, and you will see plenty of type two diabetics who sit in hospital with their broken hips or with their their asthma uh, exacerbation who, you know, trickle along perfectly well with a, a blood sugar of 31. It's when they it's when they tip over into HHS and nobody notices that causes the issue. I don't know, Shruti, well, with your experience, whether you have anything, uh, any pearls of wisdom uh, on that question. Um. Well, it's. It's hard. Well, no, first of all, I think internet, you're going using your internet guidelines is very important that you mentioned. And each um, um, trust would have a certain sort of definition, would clearly state their definition of HHS and DKA. I mean, it's a universal definition, by the way, as well. Um, but it is a tricky subset of people to um, manage. However, don't it's not all just about you managed managing them i just want to point out that you've got your seniors you've got your registrars you've got the endocrinology team you've got the diabetic specialist nurses as well often um in in our trust we would any sort of query about um sugar levels or, or anything related to diabetes we just pop a referral to diabetic specialist nurses and they do a great job um because they always discuss that case with the consultant if needs be um and like an endocrine consultant and they give great um advice and stuff so you're not alone um but definitely it is a hard subgroup of people to to manage um and on that note i've got like two sort of scenarios that i just want to want to highlight that that have occurred to me so number one is patients on a surgical um, admission who require surgery in the morning and they're a type 1 diabetic or a type 2 diabetic and they're on a sliding scale they have to be kept nil by mouth overnight and sometimes this sliding scale does not is not prescribed by the night team um, <laughs> and or actually knowing when to remove the sliding scale and stuff and so please be careful that when someone you know when you're clocking a patient or when someone clocks clocks and they tell you to um what's the word uh, prescribe their admission drugs that you do ask them about their drugs and prescribe them a lot of people just sort of write um their metformin levels and stuff because you can like if you've got in if you've got um e-prescribing you can find that from their notes but then you don't have notes for your insulin and there have been times where insulin has not been prescribed purely because they just didn't go up to the patient and ask them what their insulin units were and stuff so please don't make that mistake because it's not good um so that's that's something that i'd really like to stress upon it's not just a medical thing you will find it in any ward like whether it be a dermatology ward where whether it be a a surgical ward it's 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 really important and another thing that i wanted to stress upon is related to the first scenario that he talked about where you know this man found sulfonyl urea in in the urine test <laughs> i was in a and e as an f2 and i had a patient who was brought in by ambulance due to a hyperglycemic event was a type 1 diabetic and only after probing and like really good sort of what's what's the word like sort of being friendly and trying to get the rapport up that I then realized that this was a self-harm act where he was using his insulin um to you know to to, to unnecessarily to to sort of bring out a hypo in him and so always be mindful of these little things in the background and if something doesn't seem odd or something doesn't seem right do try do raise it with your colleagues and if you feel comfortable and you feel like you can ask those sort of certain questions and go ahead because that really changes the whole management of that patient um so yeah so those are the two things that I wanted to wanted to say um and finally sorry finally from for me for now um is that feedback Glenn has given an amazing um, presentation and we'd really like your feedback for this session. I popped it up in the chat. Um, it's a quick link. Um, so if you can fill that form whilst listening to the other questions and answers, that'll be greatly appreciated. Thank you. 
And I can I can see that um, Mart has, has, has asked a question about some quick top tips about starting a DEM, which I, I think would be quite a nice way to finish. So if that's all right, there are a couple of other questions that I can quickly rattle through and then maybe return to that to, to finish off the session. Um, I can see that uh, Mustafa has asked, in DKA patients who develop hypoglycemia during treatment, I recommended that uh, we keep them on that treatment and add glucose. Um, so how do we know when to stop the treatment? Yep, great question. Um, in all, it will vary according to your local protocol, but in order to be satisfied that somebody is no longer in DKA, you need to have gotten rid of those three criteria. You need to, they need to be no longer, no longer acutely hyperglycemic. They need to be no longer significantly acidemic and they need to no longer be significantly ketotic. If they are hypoglycemic, they are already one down, two to go. So you can continue to treat them with glucose and keep their blood sugar nicely maintained, but you will not stop that treatment until their acidemia and ketosis are also fixed. You will have cessation of treatment guidelines on your local protocol saying, um, consider DKA as resolved once ketones under this, once, uh, once uh, pH over this. OK, so you just continue. You just use exactly the same parameters. It's just that, well, iatrogenically, you've already uh, you've already sorted a third of the problem out. Um, the next question from James uh, with hypo and awareness, will you get the sympathetic activation at a lower level? Great question. Um, and I was at a conference um, a few weeks back looking at some research on this. Um, it does not seem that you will get these get this sympathetic activation at a lower level. It seems that it is just blunted. It seems that you probably won't get it at all, which is the point of hypo unawareness. By the time uh, it will be by the time your blood sugar's dropped that low, it will be too late and you'll you'll become stuporous or sleepy or enter a coma. Um, it's almost like the boy who cried wolf. Um, if you are repeatedly hypoglycemic, nobody's 100% sure of the mechanism, but your adrenal glands eventually will just call your bluff <laughs> and not release those catecholamines. OK, um, there is some evidence to suggest that good glycemic control can restore some of this function. So there is some evidence to suggest that we might be able to return hypo awareness to some people, but it's very much in their infancy. James, if you want to go and do a PhD on the topic. Please do get back to us in a few years and let us know. Uh, but no, um, it's not a lowering of the boundary. It is a blunting of that threshold. Um, and we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, Martin asks any top tips um, about starting in diabetes. I would say that, well, I don't know what your experience is, is Sruti. I often find when I was working on the diabetes ward that the patients there weren't necessarily there because of their diabetes. They were there because they had another problem and they also had diabetes and the bed managers had decided that that was the place that they could go. So make sure you're good at your GP basic pathology, your hypertensions, your COPDs, all the diseases that any multi-morbid person will come in with. What I would say is that the people who are in hospital because of their diabetes are in there because of long-term complications. Uh, that is, um, let's, let's say, um, neuropathy and vasculopathy. So um, I would suggest that you read up on your peripheral vascular diseases. Um, your kidney diseases, your AKIs and management of that. And really, really commonly, um, I mean, the orthopods and the plastic surgeons were on the diabetes ward a lot because a lot of people with chronic diabetes will come in with, with nasty ulcers and um, potentially even osteomyelitis. So get good knowledge of some antibiotics. Get good knowledge of um, how to assess an ulcer. And the best thing that I learned um, when it came to this was writing a really, really good antibiotic and bacteria uh, and I suppose microbiological history. I would 
what I did towards the end was I would refer to the microbiologist, what antibiotic does this patient need to be on? Then I'd spend a quick 10 minutes putting together a little, a little uh, summary on their the patient's notes, looking back through, they've been on this antibiotic, this antibiotic, this antibiotic, this antibiotic. This is what they've cultured on these dates over the last few years. So that the, when the microbiologist inevitably phones you very angry and says, oh, and what was their nasal swab in 2005 when they visited Mallorca? And you say you don't know and they call you an idiot, which sometimes happens. You've got all the information to hand. Know how to communicate with microbiologists. They're a strange people, they, but they can be very pleasant if you get them on side. Um, and do you have any advice when it comes to managing um, diabetes in hospital, Shruti? Um, not really. I think I've covered everything. Um, in terms of being on an endocrinology ward, um, in my trust, the endocrinology ward was basically a general medicine ward. Um, so it was a dumping ground, any random neurology symptoms. It was just basically pure dumping ground. If acute medicine couldn't solve the problem within two to three days, then they get <laughs> medicine. was the way that it worked. Um, but... You are right, I think, in terms of because there's so much complications from um, diabetes, knowing your AKI bundles that, you know, going through that and going through like ulcers and making sure you take a swab from the ulcer itself and um, sending them to the lab and having that discussion with the micro will be very, very useful. Um, and knowing how to do a peripheral vascular examination, checking for your pulses, um, sensation or all, all that all, all that stuff is is very important indeed um but yeah very true i i i would say that working in in diabetes made me a much more competent general physician um it sounds slightly flippant, but I would say if you can manage a chronic condition in a diabetic, you can probably do it in somebody without diabetes a lot more easily. Um, so they're good people to practice your medicine on. And um, final thing I'm going to say, um, learn your consultants, diabetologists, um, all have their own personal favorite insulin brand, to, whether it's Tugeo or Traceba or Lantus um, and different, depending on which consultant it is that week will want you to prescribe different things. Learn your brand names, know which one's long acting, which one's short acting. Um, and when a consultant tells you to prescribe long acting, always say, uh, do you have a preference for, for, for which particular brand? Because they almost certainly will. And they'll they'll like you a lot more for that. And they'll wax lyrical for five minutes about why Tugeo happens to be the best profile for this particular patient. But that's um, that's everything I had to say on the, on the topic. Thank you so much for listening, everybody. I hope that was useful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Glenn. And thank you to the audience for making it an engaging um, session please complete the feedback form um and this will be uploaded on youtube slash metal by midnight um tonight as well so yeah thank you cool i'll get off then Shruti. thank you so much no worries thank you very much